inside of that box is our next engine project, and it's one like we've never tackled before. No, it's not a crate engine, but it is a running motor, and actually it's one that's been a legend now for more than 50 years. Would you believe we paid less than half of what you'd expect to shell out for a complete 5.7 liter Hemi? You see, it came from a 2007 Dodge truck with about 50,000 miles on it. A perfect engine to recycle for other vehicles. We were really surprised to see how well it was pulled and packaged. We got the full accessory drive with all the hardware, even an engine harness that's still hooked up to the factory ECM. And if you look real close, they didn't even cut one wire. Now, thanks to BNR Reckon, looks like we're off to a good start. To find the Hemi we wanted, we logged onto the partslocator.com website clicked onto the parts search box, entered the year, make, and model, filled in the parts information boxes and a zip code. Then in less than a minute, we had several choices from suppliers on their network, including BNR, which had the engine we wanted for the price we wanted to pay, around $2,000. While it's ready to go into any appropriate car or truck, we've got some tweaks of our own in mind to make it an even more powerful and reliable performer. Of course, anytime you've got a Hemi for a project, you've also got a piece of high performance heritage. It was easily the most familiar four letter word in high performance history. A history that first ruled the roads in the 50s, then the tracks in a growing little sport called stock car racing. The 57 Chrysler 300 was touted as the fastest, most powerful production car in America, thanks to a 392 cubic inch Hemi with twin Carter cars. Horsepower, 375. Plymouth waited for the second generation to pack a Hemi, and it got no better than the Hemi Cuda with 425 horsepower lurking under that legendary shaker hood. A fast fish that could run quarter miles in 13 seconds. Hemi's helped Mopars win every conceivable type of racing, and during the second generation muscle car years, Hemi's ruled the streets in stripped down versions like the Super B. After 1971, there were no more Hemi production cars for over 30 years. Then came that famous question in 2003. That thing got a Hemi? Our plan is to first tear down the Hemi motor, to check all the components, and we're not using the factory harness, so it's the first thing to go. No reservations about getting this Hemi from a wrecking yard. You see, BNR documents a run test, compression check, and fluid test on every engine they sell. Here's something that makes teardown and assembly a little easier. The factory put an eye on the intake rocker of these Hemis, so you knew which side went on the intake, and the exhaust side is left unmarked. Since we are reusing all of the valve train, be sure to keep it in order. We're leaving the heads assembled, and they're off to a new piece of shop equipment. It's an ultrasonic cleaning system from Safety Clean that uses high-frequency sound waves and a special solution to thoroughly clean the parts. It penetrates to remove even embedded particles inside and outside of each component. When the cleaning cycle is finished, the optional skimmer uses a metal band to pull the contaminants out of the tank and into an outside container. It's worth it to find a machine shop that uses one, and we'll be using ours a lot in days to come. While the heads are cleaning, we can remove the oil pan, then spin the engine over and remove the oil pickup. Here's something unique to the Hemi engine, a part that doubles as a windage tray and oil pan gasket. Pretty cool, huh? But I'm easily impressed. Let's spin this thing over and get to the lifters. By giving the crankshaft a few spins, the lifters get pushed into their pockets for easy removal. Well, at least that's the idea. Well, next, using a drill bit to take tension off the timing chain makes removing the chain a lot easier. Then, after removing this cam plate, we can carefully pull out the camshaft. All right, before we tear down the bottom end, I want to mark each piston and rod so I know what hole it came out of and the direction it was in there. Now, in case you don't have a manual, quick access to the internet, or simply don't know, there's an easy way to tell which cylinder is number one. Look at the front of the block, and the piston that's closest to the front is number one. So we have one, three, five, seven on the driver's side, two, four, six, eight on the passenger side. I'm going to go ahead and mark number one with a punch. Well, here's a good way to check the overall condition of our recycled engine by 
checking the rod bearings and I'm glad to say that these look almost new. Compared to this one we pulled out of the trash with discoloration, which is a sign of heat and excessive mileage. Also, this is a good sign that the oiling system was doing its job as well. The crank's next, and I'm using this Matco tool to hold the flywheel so we can break the bolts loose. Then after removing it, we can unbolt the aluminum housing that retains the rear main seal. It's always a good idea to remove the crank sensor to keep from damaging it. Then off with the main bearings, which also confirms we got a good engine. The teardown's done, but the best is yet to come. We'll be right back. Okay, brakes over, and so is our cleaning cycle in the new ultrasonic machine. Here's what the heads look like after 20 minutes. Pretty impressive. All the embedded grime has gone inside and out. And after we get them dry, well, they'll be ready to go right back on. Here's a little Hemi heads up for you. The way you can tell a 5.7 head from a 6.1 is the shape of the exhaust port. On the 5.7, like ours, it's square. On the 6.1, it's D-shaped. Now, here's the trademark of any Hemi head, of course, the hemispherical combustion chamber with larger valves and two spark plugs per cylinder. Now, these later versions have a squish area on each side, and, well, because of that, some purists will argue that these aren't real Hemi heads. I say they should get a real life. What about you? Like the heads, the crank and other parts cleaned up just as well. Now we didn't drop the block in because it was in pretty good shape. I just washed it by hand in the sink. Now here's some block facts you need to know, especially if you plan on buying one of these as a reman. All late model Hemis come equipped with bosses for MDS in the top of the block. Now MDS is the multi-displacement system that shuts off four cylinders under light cruise loads to conserve fuel. Ours isn't equipped with it, so these little white plugs have O-rings to fill the holes. Now on the driver's side, this is a truck block, so all the bosses are drilled and tapped. If this block would have came off of the car line, some of these would be solid, and you'd have a hard time fitting it in a truck, so watch out for that. With new sealed power bearings in place, time for the crank. All third gen Hemi cranks are internally balanced with a 3.58 inch stroke. And I'll use these thrust washers installed with the grooves facing towards the crankshaft. Only cast iron cranks are used in the 5.7s, and only forged steel cranks are used in the 6.1s. The new Mali pistons have a grapple coating around the top rim that helps reduce friction and noise. And they're press fitted to the forged OEM rods that have cracked caps. Because of the aggressive valve action in a Hemi engine, the cast iron camshaft is milled on the heavy side to resist deflection. With number one at TDC, we're ready for the timing set. Now the chain has a blue link at the top that lines up with the cam sprocket and two blue links on the bottom that lines up with the crank socket and the dot. Once that's all lined up, we're ready to install it. Next, the oil pump can go back in place, followed by the pickup fitted with a new O-ring. In addition to new bearings, we're also replacing all the gaskets to keep everything sealed up. We got them from Felpro including this one for the timing cover, and we also replaced the front seal. With some oil on the back of the crank, we're ready to install the rear main seal. Now this plastic disc is there to keep the inside seal lip from pushing out when it goes onto the crank. Slip that over it, it goes right into place. Since we're reusing the stock camshaft, we're going to go ahead and reuse the lifters as well. Now as long as they go back into the original locations, they'll have the same wear pattern and you won't have a problem. We're using Felpro head gaskets on our 5.7 Hemi, and they made these things idiot proof. On the top of the gasket, they have a marking for top, right hand side, and even the cylinder numbers engraved in it. With the heads mated to the deck, we're ready for the new head bolts. Now since they're a torque to yield, they cannot be reused. The factory torque specs are as follows. The first sequence is 25 foot-pounds. The second is 40 foot-pounds. The third is an additional 90 degrees, and you do that with a torque angle meter. Next up are the push rods, followed by the factory rocker shafts. Back up front, we can install the last reused part, which is the damper. Well, at least that was the plan. 
You have to roll with the punches sometimes when you hit a snag in your buildup. Now we want to run this electric Mazir water pump and their adapter plate, but I ran into a little problem. This is a truck timing cover and the plate doesn't fit it. This is built specifically for a car cover. Oops. So we use partslocator.com again. Got the right one shipped so we don't have to sacrifice the electric pump. The car cover has an extra water port that we have to tap and plug it with a 3 8 pipe plug. Now we can reinstall a balancer and bolt up the backing plate for our Mazir pump. It's anodized black with a captured gasket to provide the best possible seal. This Mazir 300 series is the big daddy of water pumps with a flow capacity of 55 gallons per minute. It's also got a built-in O-ring, so we'll never have a leak from it. We're going to streamline the Hemi's induction system with a NEFI throttle body setup we've been wanting to try, but had to have a compatible intake manifold like this mod man we got from Indy Cylinder Heads. Now the bottom runner is pre-drilled to accept four different top plates, including the single four that we're going to be using. There's also a double four and even for a six pack. Plus, if you got to have it, supercharger. All the top plates are machined with tapered air shear exits to promote fuel atomization. So far, no big surprises building this recycled new age Hemi. We'll see what happens in the dyno though when we come back, so better stay close. We're back and moving on. Time to see what this thing makes. Here's a heads up for you guys that plan on putting together a Hemi just like this one. The guys at Indy thought a step ahead and put ports in the front and back side of the intake. Now that's actually a spot for the engine to breathe. Since the valve covers don't have a location for a breather or even a spot to fill the engine with oil. You'll have to remove the valve cover, but it's no big deal because of the captured gasket. Makes things pretty easy. Let's go ahead and fill her up. Of course, you want to be careful not to get any oil in those spark plug holes. Now a piece of vacuum hose comes in handy for installing the spark plugs all 16 of them, because if you just dropped them in, you might mess up the gaps. Next, we can bolt up the valve covers and reinstall the stock sensors. Well, now it's about time to show you how we're gonna feed that big elephant motor. With our Modman intake, we got the usual choices, but we've been looking for a good reason to try out one of these fast, self-tuning EFI systems. Now, you don't need a laptop or tuning experience to use this technology. It's a complete system with 4150 throttle body, appropriate injectors, sensors, broadband O2 sensor, and of course the self-tuning ECU. It also comes with a handheld display unit. Now that we have the fuel delivery covered with the new FAST system, the next question is how are we going to get power to the coils and the rest of the sensors? Well, the answer is in this Hemi 6 timing and RPM controller from MSD. Now it comes with this box and a nice harness with all factory style connections to plug into each of the components. The only thing the FAST system needs to see from it is a tack output. The connectors are even labeled to make the hookup idiot proof. For a solid connection, make sure you solder the wires for both the TAC and the 12 volt power source, which of course is our dyno battery. The last thing, hook the MSD box up to the harness. It's real critical that you wire any EFI harness directly to the battery so you don't get interference from outside sources. All right, now it's time to use the handheld display and this is where we put all the parameters of the engine into the ECU so it can tune itself while you drive or, in our case, run it on the dyno. Now, once again, you don't need a computer engineering degree to work this thing. At least they tell me. Well, first we need to power it up and select yes to start a new tune. Now enter the cubic inches, 345 for this Hemi. Desired idle speed. Let's go with 800. We're using a single throttle body, so we select that. 43 PSI is the recommended fuel pressure, and eight cylinders is correct, of course. Now the ECU needs to know what voltage corresponds to open and closed throttle. First, it captures the idle or closed position value. Then it tells us to hold the throttle wide open until it captures that value. And that's it for the basic setup. The next step is to start the engine and let it warm up. 
Oh, you can also use the handheld to monitor live data like engine temperature, air fuel mix, and so on. All right, we're gonna do a sweep from 25 to 6,000. There we go. Three hundred and seventy-five horsepower, three hundred and seventy-two foot-pounds of torque. Let's make another run. All right, nice smooth run. It still has a little bit of a learning curve to go through, and it's obviously going through it right now. Numbers are getting better and better. Oh, wow, 400 horsepower at 6,000 RPM with 393 foot-pounds at 4,600. This motor made 345 in that old Dodge Ram. It's not too bad. Here's a cool feature. Should you lose a sensor like, well, air temp sensor, throttle position sensor, even an ejector, the ECU goes into a limp mode. It keeps the motor running, and you've got enough power to make it home. That ought to be some comfort to you carb guys. We'll be right back. You're watching Horsepower. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Horsepower collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. For a lot of guys, replacing an older muscle car steering column only means one option, and that's a pricey, shiny new aftermarket piece. Well, now you can recycle, keep the retro look, and even reap the savings. That's thanks to Steering Columns Galore, who has over 3,000 columns in stock that are all outfitted with new components and go through a 10-point inspection to ensure that you get a column that's better than new. Now, they even give you the option to paint it whatever color you want to match your car's interior. Prices start at $325 with a core. You know, this could be one of the handiest tools that you keep in your home shop or take to the drag strip. It's called the Hot Rod Calc from Mr. Gasket. It's a street strip performance calculator and the first one with built-in solutions for engine building and performance. In your garage, you can instantly calculate how changes in components will affect your engine's compression, displacement, air fuel efficiency, and so on. At the strip, you can quickly calculate how temperature, elevation, and humidity will affect your ETs. Here's how you do a basic ET calculation. Let's say we got a 400 horsepower car that weighs 3,500 pounds. The ET at a quarter mile would be about 12 seconds. Of course, you can factor in more variables for more advanced calculations, but the information in here is just about endless. Not the price, however, only about 80 bucks. Well, according to my calculations, it's about time for us to go, but we'll see you next time.